moment is here, you can stop your search, it's Comics by Perch. Hey everybody, this is Perch, and uh, going through the mail, got a viewer question. As it happens, there's an article on Bleeding Cool, which actually kind of helps illustrate the answer to this question better than I ever could. But uh, let's get to the question. The question goes, hey Perch, love the channel, thanks for doing everything you do, which I'm assuming uh, by this uh, she means f four videos a day, three videos a day, too many videos a day. Anyway, sorry, the mail continues. I'm curious how much crossover you see between the MCU, the TV version, and the comics. Increasingly, it feels to me that the big fans of the TV show, of the MCU, of the movies, are not fans of the comics, but they're starting to dictate what the comic readers get. If the comic audience is a completely different audience, that seems like it would be a good thing. More money for Disney. However, if the comics are going to try and cater to the MCU audience who aren't buying the comics anyway... That seems dangerous. What do you think? Well, okay, first of all, I think that's a great observation. And I think there's some truth to what you're saying there. I do think the comics has this inferiority complex where they feel like they need to keep up with what's going on in the, uh, in the movies and in TV. Even though if you talk to a lot of creators, the writers in general, um, they will dismiss that and, and say that uh, the, you know, the movies and, and those things, it's cool to see their characters up on the big screen, but it also frustrates them because they're not really kept in the loop, but Editorial then tells them that they, they have to tie into it, and it, it's kind of a big mess. I'm going to see a couple friends at uh, Emerald City here in a couple days, and uh, and I expect to hear the same story again. I, I was hearing it every single time there was a con before the pandemic. Well, um, so, you know, it, it, before I go, go any further answering this question, this article pops up on November 28th by Ray Fluck, who's a contributor to Bleeding Cool. Uh, what is Ray Fluck? He is a television editor. OK, now this article actually just lays out um, a pretty stark, a, a bunch of things that, that most people don't say out loud. But this article just just he just writes it out there. So let's see what he says. He talks about um, the article basically begins at the story of what led to my ugly breakup with comics and fully baptizing myself in the glory that is television is one that I've told once or twice in the past. So I won't do a full rehash this time around. Now, I want to read this first paragraph pretty much in its entirety because um, not only is it, it there's there's some wild exaggerations here, but it's interesting as it goes. Um, okay. All right. When the cheap plug, blah, blah, blah. For me, comics stopped being fun when they became $20 for six pages of stories and 14 pages of Snickers ads. The 24-7 endless event cycle began creating a numbness where nothing had any meaning anymore. Is X-Men getting rebooted for the 1,283rd time? Cool. How long will that last? Until fall of the Empire of the Ultimate Expansion Manifesto to the Revenge? Are there any more words left to put in front of Crisis? And if you go outside Marvel and DC to Image in the Indies, you get an epic four-issue series stretched out over four years, assuming it gets finished. And even then, it started feeling less like a comic book reading experience and more like I was checking out someone's pitch storyboards for a series deal. And don't get me started on the hypocrisy behind the pirated comics debate and how the comic industry looked its readership in their eyes and pretty much told them to go fuck themselves in the middle of the pandemic. Okay, lot to unpack there in that, that paragraph, but I want to point out, um, obviously, you know, insane exaggerations for, I, I don't know, the, the point of sounding cool in an article. Um, but it's interesting, they talk, uh, this writer talks about, you know, six pages of stories for $20. Basically, comics are too expensive for what you get, okay? That's a complaint that, I don't know, I see a lot of comic creators push back hard on and get pretty angry when the fans mention that. Uh, Jimmy Paul Metti uh, made that made similar comments. The comic seemed too expensive, and his own peers turned on him pretty aggressively. Um, talking about reboots, I mean, I don't know. I keep hearing that reboots are necessary from sites like Bleeding Cool in order to refresh the audience and appeal to a new generation. And then uh, how about this, the talking about uh, dismissing the indies because there are four issues stretched out over years uh, feeling like a Netflix pitch. Again, there's a lot of YouTubers that talk about uh, these these comics being like Netflix pitches, and those people are called bigots and racists, but uh, apparently it's okay here. And I'm not sure exactly um, the comic industry looked its readership in the eyes and pretty much told them to go fuck themselves in the middle of the pandemic. I mean, what? I, but, but, but really, what? I, I don't, sorry, I don't, I don't know where to go with any of that. But uh, that's the, then the article, and you might go, wait a minute, this, this whole video started with talking about the MCU. Oh, we're getting there. 
So then the second paragraph said, uh, it wasn't until the Walt Disney Company's D23 event back in 2019 that I fully understood why I left comics and why it was so easy to embrace television as the next logical step. Okay, um, interesting. What is that step and what was the revelation in 2019? Well, he goes on, it uh, the debut of all these amazing uh, actors like Jeffrey Wright as The Watcher and Anthony Mackie. Sebastian Stan, Emily Van Camp, Wyatt Russell, Elizabeth Olsen, Paul Bettany, uh, Teona Paris, Kate Dennings, Randall Park, Catherine Hahn, then Mar Miss Marvel, Moon Knight, and She-Hulk, all leading to the small screen. And he summarizes up basically that uh, when I look back on how that presentation went and what we've seen from the streamer regarding Marvel Studios' project at the time, I couldn't help feel like some wheels were finally starting to turn when it came to diversity and representation. Did they take too long to start turning, and is there room for them to turn a whole hell of a lot faster? Definitely, but it was a start. Okay, so basically what flipped this guy over, he's saying, is, uh, you know, this this very weird uh, amount of stuff. And, and again, the timing is all bizarre here. So he talks about, uh, you know, the comic industry saying F you during the middle of the pandemic. Uh, but then he talks about it wasn't until the event back in 2019. I don't know. Maybe there was a pandemic pre-2019 or the timeline's just all wonky here. This article doesn't actually make any sense if you start to read it up. But uh, basically, it's, hey, I looked at a D23 presentation and realized, huh, it's, uh, you know, there's more diversity here. And there's another line here that says, uh, while this may be not a popular point to make with some, no one has yet to make a solid argument why a comic book couldn't be a monthly animated short. I mean, cost. Cost cost is the reason. Honestly, that, that is the big reason. And also, not everything has to be on TV. It turns out some people like things that are printed. Um, when you're a global media company, you try and uh, print things and you put it on TV and you put it in music and you put it everywhere because that's how you make your money and, and cover all the bases. That's, that's why. That, that's, that's the solid argument right there. It's more expensive to do it as an animated short. Also, an animated short is different from a comic. And uh, it's a fairly bizarre argument to say that uh, we have to have either comic books or animated shorts. Those two are not mutually exclusive. You, you can have both. And probably should have both. That's a very weird. That's a very weird argument to make. But all right. So the article basically is summarizing that this guy likes the MCU much better because of diversity and representation. And then this weird batch of things at the beginning that feel like somebody auditioning for a very bad comedy bit, as opposed to any kind of coherent point. But it's this next panel that um, is uh, is thoroughly bizarre. And then, and I'm quoting the article here, there was a Marvel Comics panel at D23 2019. Build is a tour. So so basically, by the way, the guy's comparing a, a Sizzler reel of a bunch of logos, which was Miss Marvel and Moon Knight, She-Hulk, some of these other people there. And then there was another part to this big event. And once again, this guy is, is saying we can only have one thing, movies or comics. We can't have both. And so he says, when it came time to do the comics panel, Build as a tour through eight decades of Marvel Comics history, highlighting the highs, lows, and craziness in between. The panel was hosted by Marvel Editor-in-Chief C.B. Sobolski and Executive Editor Tom Brevoort. And it was just that. It, in other words, it was how it was billed. It, it was promoted as uh, going through eight decades of Marvel history. And then the complaint here is it was, it was, it was that. It was going through Marvel history. It was basically what it said it was going to be. Interesting. A nostalgia trip back through the very white male good old days of the comics industry, which normally makes my skin squirm a bit because it always begs the question of just how good the good old days of comics were for women, creators of color, and members of the LGBTQ community. But my brain couldn't stop comparing it with the message Disney Plus sent, and the difference was crystal clear. One was about looking toward the future with a willingness to try new things. The other harkened back to a time that not many find too friendly to harken back to. Not, not many? This entire business was built on those eight, those eight decades. You're, you're comparing a panel of here's some future projects we're doing on Disney Plus to here's a, a look back on history. D D23, for what it's worth, also had a panel on uh, the history of Disney animation. Was that was that also cringy and uncomfortable? Um, what? I want to point out that this author is a white male, by the way. But anyway, OK, anyway, um, 
I get the argument there's nothing wrong with celebrating one past as you look to the future, but at a D23 that vibed the future is now, it felt like no one could read the room on the comic side. And they did they have to have Sobolski on stage? Because seeing Akira Yoshida waxing nostalgically about the golden years of comics felt like a knife wound to that portion of my brain that can't accept blatant hypocrisy and twisted irony. And then it goes into the whole, uh, the, you know, he, he goes into explaining for the eight billionth time the Akira Yoshida uh, pseudonym that Sobolski uh, used to get comics gigs. He, he neglects to note that uh, Akira Yoshida was uh, recommended and, and was well known by Marvel at the time and instead kind of tries to frame it here that Sobolski came up with this alias uh, completely on his own with uh, no input from the company and no one at Marvel actually knew it existed, which uh, is, is, is not the case. But, but anyway, um, essentially, he says, Akira Yoshida took a job from a real-life Japanese creator. Uh, no, that there, there was never a job offered to a Japanese creator. I'm not saying it wasn't stupid, by the way. It, it was stupid, but you're, you're making it sound like this guy came up with it on his own. And uh, it's, it's weird. The, the article goes on, To this day, I'm still not sure how comics journalism sites didn't do more to call him out on the carpet from this fraud. They all did. It, the problem is you couldn't go too far with calling them out on the carpet. I mean, ask Rich on your own site. They couldn't do that because Marvel knew. And if they want to go hard at it, Marvel's going to cut you off. And all these comic sites are leeches that depend on Marvel, giving them you know various access to creators. That's that's what's going on. Anyway, what uh, what it goes and that's the, the article concludes with, and that's when I understood for the first time why my unhealthy relationship with comics needed to end. We were both looking for different things. With television, I found a partner I could develop a healthy future with, while comics kept wanting to relive prom night from 1963. Okay, I, I, this is a thoroughly, thoroughly insulting and stupid article. I, I mean, there, there's no other way to, to look at it. But back to that original viewer question. Um, yeah, I think in many cases they are separate audiences. And that is okay. There's a comic audience. There's a TV audience. I do think it's disastrous if the comic audience starts listening to like this guy, this uh, this Ray guy, uh, bleeding cool, and and says, "Hey, this is how we should steer our comics to make this guy happy." That's insane. Um, it just as insane as it is to say, "Hey, in this panel where we're going to look at the history of comics, uh, I was very disappointed because they looked at the history of comics." And, and then you are out of your mind if you're saying that uh, this, this looking back at the history of comics, eight decades of Marvel, is hearkening back to a time that not many find friendly to hearken back to. Are you insane? Marvel is, is well-loved. That era is very well-loved. No, not just by a few toxic fans on Twitter, but by a lot of people. Go check out for a moment what's actually selling on Amazon. What are the top sellers? You might be surprised that many of those comics are from the past. Not from like a month or two in the past, but from way back in the past. The histories of Marvel and DC, unless you know, you're saying that Marvel has a bad past, but DC doesn't for some crazy reason, um, it, that's pretty insane. It's also pretty ignorant to say that uh, there, were, uh, there were good old days for white people and that women, creators of color, and members of the LGBT community uh, didn't have a role there. Uh, frankly, they did. We've covered, we've interviewed several on this channel. We've talked to others. It is, uh, is a myth and a lie to claim that it was all big white boy club. It's just not true. But there is a group that hails and, uh, and, you know, stands the TV shows because I, I don't know, man, for this stupid ass reason. Um, the important thing here is that comics can be their own thing. And yes, they can be translated to TV and granted TV can do some things that gets translated back into comics. They can both exist side by side and, and here's the shocker, appeal to a diverse, huge audience absolutely can happen. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's a bizarre counterpoint, but it, it, I think that, um, I, I think that it, it, there's just so many stupid things here to, to get into. Um, look, I think that if you, uh, destroy your past because you think it's uncomfortable or it makes people in the present uncomfortable, 
Uh, that's nice. You should try and make people comfortable whenever you can, but not at the expense of your history. That's, that's insane. Um, your history is important, not just for the because you'll be doomed to repeat it if you ignore it, but because it's pretty much the height of arrogance to say, hey, here's this, uh, this small uh, group of people who weren't alive during the majority of this history who's now telling us that uh, they don't, not only they don't want to hear about the history, but they don't want anyone else to hear about it either. And that's a crazy thing that kind of this article goes into, which is, yeah, we should stop talking about it completely. It makes me uncomfortable. I don't like it. And why am I uncomfortable? Well, not because I'm personally offended. I'm, I'm uncomfortable on someone else's behalf, but mostly because I wanted to see more of those uh, MCU TV trailers. That's what made me comfortable, seeing those trailers. Um, it's bizarre to see <laughs> the industry of Weinstein and others get hailed as being uh, so forward-looking. Um, it is also bizarre, I mean, again, as somebody who's older, uh, to see this this group of people who are uh, wanting to really get behind Disney, Disney, as being a uh, you know representative, diverse, great company. I mean, um, I got bad news. I don't. I, I guess you know to the guy's point here. Don't go looking back in history because you'll see some things that uh, were printed and talked about about uh, old Disney, even as uh, recently as like 2014, that uh, they aren't so aren't so cool. Um, you know, take a look at who the executive team is at Disney sometime. I know that Kevin Feige, uh, is a, uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, last I checked, he was a straight white guy. J j I don't know. Just, just saying, um, but what are we even doing here to, to answer the original viewers question? Um, yeah, there, they can be different audiences. They can also be the same audience it really is whatever you go for. And if comics are smart, they'll carve out their own niche worry about, you know, satisfying their own audience and kind of leave it at that and not get uh, too wound up in the rest of this. Uh, trying to connect these two together is silly. TV is a, has different storytelling techniques, different pacing, different ways that it, it portrays its, uh, its material. It's different. Um, they're, they're not meant to be the same, nor do they need to be. It's good to just get all the money. Anyway, um, an incredibly ignorant article, but a great question. Uh, thank you for sending it in. Great viewer question. Um, just, just bizarre. I, this, this is just a, a bizarre. And I, I need to do a video at some point talking about the uh, Akira Ishida Sabolsky uh, business again at some point, and because I think this is another one where um, people a misunderstand what happens, and then people also like to misconstrue what other people say. Uh, for the record, again. Uh, some people might in the comments have already started to yap away about it. Um, I, I don't think that was a good thing to create a, a pseudonym, um, period. Uh, worse to create a pseudonym of a different ethnicity, I, I guess. I mean, the, the worst part is it was trying to portray the writer as Asian because there was this, uh, oh, let's just call it racist uh, view inside the publisher that if they put an Asian name up there, we'll have more authenticity as Asian product. That's dumb thinking. That's not on the fans, kids. That's that's on the publisher. That, that's all on the publisher for deciding that. But it is stupid. Uh, it's a stupid decision. Uh, nor do I think Sobolski is uh, gets off scot free, particularly when he carries the torch for we are we are doing great things with representation. Again, if if that's the the hill you're going to die on, you got to address your own past. Yeah, I, I do think you do, as it turns out. They hired Sobolski because he's a happy-go-lucky, pretty much a fan-friendly face to put on the company that was going to be more uh, cheerful and fit more with Disney policy than Axel Alonso did. That's, that's why he's got the job. Um, but the part that I just, again, you could, you could say it's good, bad, it's, that's all on you, all your decision. But uh, to portray that uh, the company had no idea what was going on, <laughs> yeah, bullshit. I've talked to more than enough people at Marvel before this controversy came out. They all knew. They they absolutely knew. Anyway, thanks for the viewer question. Insane article. I, I guess I won't even note that um, one day earlier, same writer did an article on the same site uh, talking about, uh, should we be getting worried because we haven't heard word from uh, Hitmonkey and Marvel's MODOK show? They seem to be... Uh, in limbo and likely canceled. 
and uh, continued on with um, the uh, Fenders, Tiger and Dazzler show, and Howard the Duck were canceled. And uh, Marvel's Cloak and Dagger was canceled. His runways was canceled. Cool. How's that? Uh, how's that looking to the future going for you? Thanks for listening. <laughs>